I'm Howard Patterson. When I was a young biologist at the University of California at Santa Cruz, I started juggling with the guy across the hall and a few friends, and we ended up founding a theatrical ensemble called the Flying Karamazov Brothers. After graduating, as co-valedictorians, we decided to perform for a year or two before going to graduate school, and then 34 years passed. We played all over the world, with six runs on Broadway, Shakespeare at Lincoln Center, Carnegie Hall, a major motion picture, in which we played juggling Sufi warriors, and a much-watched episode of Seinfeld. That's me, fighting with Jerry and Jason. But I did finally go back to graduate school, where I got a master's in environmental management and a professional certificate in river restoration. I've worked for the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation and the West Multnomah Soil and Water Conservation District. Right now I'm writing a book. When I heard about the city council's plan to fluoridate Portland's water, even though we'd voted it down three times, I had no preconceptions. I'd always heard it was a good thing. I knew fluoride was toxic, but I hadn't heard any discussion about the effects of releasing it into the environment. So I started to research the scientific literature. I had three main questions. Does fluoridation actually reduce tooth decay in the first place? Does it have negative human health effects? Does it have negative effects on the environment? I'll start with the third question, because that's my primary area of expertise, and because that's the part missing from the current debate. First of all, what is fluoride? Fluorine is an element belonging to the halide family, closely related to chlorine. It most commonly occurs in its ionized form. That is, it is most stable when it gains an electron and becomes negatively charged, at which point it's called fluoride. Unlike chlorine, fluoride has no biochemical function. It is not required by any organism, and not a single biological process has been shown to require fluoride. In large concentrations, it is extremely toxic. In fact, fluorine was one of the first toxic industrial pollutants to be identified. As early as 1855, lawsuits awarded huge damages to local farmers and residents around metal smelting factories because of severe damage to crops, livestock, and human health. It wasn't until the early 20th century that fluorine was finally identified as the culprit. Aluminum manufacture and phosphate fertilizer production produce huge quantities of fluorine. It's also a key ingredient in many pesticides. Fluoride has long been known to be highly toxic to plants, animals, and humans at high concentrations. Proponents of fluoridation claim that it is harmless at low concentrations. The question is, at what concentrations, and harmless to whom? For many years, the optimal concentration of fluoride in fluoridated water has been considered to be about one part per million. That seems like a very small amount. Humans only drink about 1% of the water that goes through our city water system. What happens to all the organisms downstream when that fluoridated water stream is added to our rivers? Now, fluoridation proponents claim that fluoride levels of one part per million can't be dangerous to wildlife because the background level of fluoride naturally occurring in the ocean is 1.4 parts per million. That's true in the salty ocean, but life in fresh water is chemically very different. The natural background level of fluoride in the Willamette and the Columbia is less than 0.1 part per million, and that's the level that native salmon evolved to deal with. Let's talk about the difference between salt and fresh water. The mineral we call salt is sodium chloride. When salt dissolves in water, it separates into positively charged sodium ions and negatively charged chloride ions. In the salty ocean, the concentration of salt atoms outside a fish is higher than the concentration of salt inside the fish. Diffusion makes the salt molecules try to move inside the fish until the concentration is the same. To maintain its healthy salt balance, the fish has to use its gills to actively pump salts out of its body. Any fluoride atoms in the water are kept out as well. But in fresh waters, the concentration of salt atoms inside the fish is much higher than the concentration outside. The pressure of diffusion tends to force salts out of the fish's body. To stay healthy, the fish has to actively pump sodium back in. Chlorine is negatively charged, so it follows the positive sodium ions. If there's any fluoride in the water, remember, fluorine is a smaller, more mobile molecule than chlorine, and it will also follow the sodium into the fish. And that is where it stays and accumulates. Research shows that among aquatic animals, fluoride accumulates in the bones and teeth of vertebrates and in the exoskeletons of invertebrates. This is the body's mechanism for trying to reduce fluoride poisoning, getting it out of body fluids and hiding it in bones and teeth. The concentration of fluoride in those hard tissues continues to increase throughout an animal's life. 
This process of bioaccumulation is called fluorosis, and it happens in mammals exposed to fluoride as well, including humans. It's surprising how little research has been done on the environmental effects of such a toxic chemical. We know from experiments with rainbow trout, Oncorhynchus mycus, the same species as steelhead, that salmonids, salmon and trout, are more sensitive to fluoride than other fish. Rainbows are flat out killed by doses of about 3.5 parts per million and as low as 2.7 parts per million. That's actually less than the EPA's recommended maximum level of 4 parts per million. And we know that as water temperature increases, fluoride becomes more lethal to rainbow trout. This is particularly noteworthy as climate change predictions tell us water temperatures will increase in the future. When water has large concentrations of salts like calcium and magnesium, it's referred to as hard water. As water hardness decreases, as the water becomes softer, a small dose of fluoride becomes more lethal to rainbow trout. This is important because water in the Northwest is unusually soft. In 1990, the British Columbia Ministry of Environment combined the two previous studies of temperature and of water hardness, did the math, and set a maximum threshold of 0.2 parts per million of fluoride for salmonids in soft northwest waters, a safe level of no more than 0.2 parts per million. The most complete and robust real-world study of salmonids and fluoride in the Northwest was conducted by two scientists working for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Dam Kayer and Day. In the late 70s, the PIT tag was invented, a tiny electronic transmitter that made it possible for the first time to track the movements of individual salmon. When NOAA scientists began to track the migration of salmon in the Columbia River, they found that fish using the fish ladders at each dam took about one day to get through the ladder and past the dam, but that at John Day Dam, fish passage was averaging almost a week. They also found that 55% of the fish that passed Bonneville were not making it to McNary. A very large number of fish was dying. John Day Dam was built just below the confluence of the John Day River with the Columbia. It has two spectacular fish ladders, one on either side of the dam. Scientists could tell that tagged salmon were congregating by the entrances, but appeared to be reluctant to enter the fishway system. When they did go through, they showed a significant preference for the south fishway. Changing the water flow or the entrance locations didn't help, so they tested for pollutants in the water and found high concentrations of fluoride. They soon realized that the probable source was the aluminum plant right next to the river, which dumped over 800 pounds of fluoride a day directly into the Columbia. The presence of an aluminum plant by the river isn't a coincidence. To a large degree, the dams on the Columbia were built in order to generate electricity for numerous aluminum smelters around the Northwest, to make aluminum to manufacture the war materiel that won World War II. So, Dam Kayer and Day established numerous sampling stations around the dam and the two rivers, and discovered levels of fluoride between 0.3 and 0.5 parts per million. In 1983, the EPA came down hard on the aluminum plant and made them put most of their fluoride effluent in a landfill, which cut the amount going into the river by three quarters. The level of fluoride dropped to 0.1 to 0.2 parts per million, and salmon now took about one day to pass through either fishway at John Day, and unaccountable loss dropped to 5% or less. To find out exactly what fluoride threshold would not affect salmon behavior and survival, the researchers began an experiment here at Big Beef Creek Research Station in Washington State. Returning wild Chinook, Coho, and Chum salmon were introduced to a two-way flume, and the researchers randomly put fluoride at various concentrations in one of two flume choices. At a concentration of 0.5 parts per million, the salmon not only avoided the flume with the fluoride, many of them refused to make a choice and wouldn't advance up the flume at all. It wasn't until they dialed the chloride concentration down to 0.2 parts per million that the salmon didn't distinguish between the flumes and were no more reluctant to make a choice than control salmon with no fluoride on either side. Remember, that level... 0.2 parts per million is the same one the British Columbia Ministry of Environment calculated to be the maximum safe level for salmonids in northwest waters. And that's pretty much all we know about fluoride and salmon in the environment. There is some evidence that water treatment plants release water with a greater concentration of fluoride than that of the municipal water supply itself, so water released into the environment may have an even higher fluoride concentration than city water. We also know that elevated levels of fluoride from municipal wastewater sources can persist in a river for miles before the concentration returns to natural background levels. And that's it.
Now, we know that salmon are being hard-pressed at this point in time. Salmon evolved over tens of millions of years to grow large and fertile oceans, then migrate by the hundreds of millions up pristine rivers through dense forests whose falling trunks created hospitable pools, and to breed and lay their eggs in gravelly creeks and feed and fertilize the forest with their carcasses after they die, leaving their young to feed on abundant insects before returning to the sea. But in the last centuries, we have overfished the oceans, blocked the rivers, cut down the forests, cleared out the fallen trunks and pools, the slopes to bury the river gravel and silt, and inundated the water with pesticides and pollutants that attack both the salmon and their insect food supply. That's why the wild Atlantic salmon is extinct in the U.S. and most of Europe, and why the Pacific salmon species are reduced to 1% of their original numbers. Alarmed by the near destruction of these economically, culturally, and ecologically vital species, we have regulated fishing, built enormous fish ladders, removed entire dams, replanted forests, restored channel and pool structures and gravel river bottoms, established buffers to agriculture, and cleaned up pollution, spending literally billions of dollars to try to save these endangered fish. And yet, after Dam Kayer and Day's study, which indicated a real threat to migrating endangered salmon from a pollutant we have control over, there has not been a single follow-up study for almost 25 years. Why is this? The environmental scientists I've asked, who choose to remain nameless, pointed out that the proponents of fluoridation have done a remarkably thorough job of portraying anybody who questions its use as raving lunatics who fear and misunderstand science. Scientists are very reluctant to stick their necks out because those who have have often been reprimanded, suspended from professional organizations, or lost licenses. Some important and powerful people have actually lost their jobs for going against the fluoride conventions. Neurotoxicologist Dr. Phyllis Mullenix was fired as chair of toxicology at Forsyth Dental Center for publishing her findings on lasting damage to the central nervous system, including hyperactivity and depression, from low concentrations of fluoride. Toxicologist Dr. William Marcus was fired as senior science advisor in each PA's Office of Drinking Water for questioning government censorship of the National Toxicology Program's report that implicated fluoride's role in bone cancer and other cancers. After a four-year battle, he was reinstated. Secretary of Labor Robert Reich said, The true reason for the discharge was retaliation. There are dozens of other examples. Damkayer and Day raise an enormous number of questions, and it's very strange that no further study has been done. I'm particularly curious about young salmon. Unlike adults, the young live and eat in fluoridated waters for years. How does the fluoride accumulated in their bones affect their long-term survival in the ocean and their success in returning to spawn? Fluoride is a potent insecticide, and young salmon eat mostly insects. We know very low concentrations of fluoride kill web-spinning caddisflies, one of the major food sources for young salmon. The concentration that's safe for salmon, 0.2 parts per million, is lethal to this insect family. We don't know whether losing that vital food supply in fluoridated water is another source of fluoride stress for juvenile salmon, let alone for the rest of the ecosystem. So, several lines of research show the safe threshold of fluoride for salmon to be 0.2 parts per million. The concentration of fluoride considered optimal by fluoride proponents is about one part per million. Fluoride appears to be further concentrated by wastewater treatment plants. It can take many miles for fluoride levels to return to the natural background levels. Last year, the Center for Disease Control became aware that 41% of American adolescents show signs of dental fluorosis, and in response, they modified their recommendation to an optimal level of 0.7 parts per million. This concentration still is likely to have dramatic negative environmental effects. Folks and Anderson, in their thorough review of the existing research, insisted on the 0.2 parts per million level and called for the immediate banning of fluoridation. There's much more to be learned, but nobody to my knowledge is doing those studies. It's worth pointing out that we've put an enormous amount of effort and money into restoring tributary rivers like Tryon Creek and Johnson Creek in an attempt to reestablish salmon and steelhead runs in the Willamette Basin. Now we're talking about dumping into the entrance to that basin and the Columbian Basin a quantity of a pollutant that's been proven to be a barrier to salmon migration. But is some environmental destruction worthwhile if we have a really significant decrease in children's cavities? Let's get back to our three original questions. Does fluoride actually work to eliminate tooth decay? The evidence for the effectiveness of topical application of fluoride in toothpastes, mouthwashes, and dentist compounds is very good. 
Fluoride proponents will tell you that there is an enormous body of research to indicate the effectiveness of water fluoridation in reducing tooth decay. That body of research exists, though many critics have pointed out the poor methodology and poor choice of test populations in these old studies. Some critics have observed that the bulk of that research was largely produced by the Kettering Laboratories of the University of Cincinnati and the Mellon Institute in Pittsburgh, both funded by Alcoa Aluminum, the country's largest fluoride polluter at the time, at a time when the Public Health Service, which was the major force behind fluoridation and which began to campaign for it before the first major study of fluoridation was even completed, was under the jurisdiction of Secretary of the Treasury Andrew W. Mellon, the founder both of Alcoa and of the Mellon Institute. These entanglements have caused some critics to question that research's impartiality. So in 1999, to settle the question once and for all, the British Department of Health asked the Center for Reviews and Dissemination to fund an exhaustive survey of all the fluoridation research that had been done in the world thus far. The study was conducted by the University of York and is known as the York Review. The study, published in 2000, found a median increase in cavity-free children of 14.6% and a median decrease in decayed missing and filled teeth of 2.25 teeth. They also found no clear association between water fluoridation and cancers or bone fractures. Policymakers around the world, including our former mayor, trumpeted this as proof of water fluoridation's efficacy. So much so that the CRD issued another report in 2003 called What the York Review Really Found. They felt policymakers were misinterpreting the report and asked them to actually read the whole thing. What the report really found was that there was no good data anywhere in the world and that so far no new information had changed that opinion. They pleaded for good high-quality fluoride studies to be done and warned that more bad studies wouldn't help. So the U.S. National Institute of Health commissioned just such a rigorous study from the University of Iowa, a multi-million dollar research project referred to as the Iowa Fluoride Study. It is a long-term ongoing study of over 600 children, carefully monitored since birth. It is the first study ever to examine actual total ingestion of fluoride in its relationship to tooth decay, to fluorosis, and to bone health. The much-awaited first set of results was published in 2009 and was quite surprising to public health officials. They found absolutely no correlation between fluoride ingestion and tooth decay. Let me say that again. No correlation between fluoride ingestion and tooth decay. They did, however, find a significant relationship between fluoride ingestion and fluorosis. They discovered that children with no cavities had received the same amount of fluoride at each stage of life as children with cavities. Cavities were not related to fluoride intake, but fluorosis was. They went on to suggest, perhaps it is time that the term optimal fluoride intake be dropped from common usage. The researchers also looked at specific levels of fluoride in the children's drinking water. Again, they found drinking fluoridated water did increase fluorosis, but didn't decrease cavities. A subset of the children were given only bottled water with a very low level of fluoride, around 0.1 parts per million. If fluoride were effective, these children should have had a larger number of cavities. But the researchers found no difference between the bottled water drinkers and the fluoride drinkers. Their latest publication showed that more frequent toothbrushing did result in fewer new cavities beginning to form, but that fluoride content of drinking water did not. Now, there has been a general decline in the number of cavities in the United States since fluoridation became popular. As a matter of fact, tooth decay has declined throughout the developed world, even though few countries beside the U.S. fluoridate their water. As this graph from the World Health Organization shows, the same precipitous declines in tooth decay have occurred in countries that fluoridate and in countries that do not. The improvements are probably attributable to better dental hygiene and nutrition, but not to fluoridated water. So, to come back to our original questions... We've seen that environmental research is slim, but there is excellent evidence that optimum levels of fluoridation are harmful to salmon survival and other parts of the ecosystem. We've seen that as far as its effectiveness goes, all the evidence that says it's good is bad evidence, and all the good evidence says it doesn't actually work. But what about its safety? Let's ask the scientists responsible for regulating fluoride in the United States. Chapter 280 of the NTEU is the union representing the 1,500 scientists, engineers, and lawyers who work at EPA headquarters in Washington, D.C. 
The scientists began, like most Americans, with the assumption that fluoride was safe and effective. When they found themselves being pressured to alter scientific results to allow damaging concentrations of fluoride in drinking water, they tried to settle it in-house, but the EPA wouldn't or couldn't resist outside political demands. So the scientists joined a lawsuit against the EPA. As they looked at the mounting scientific evidence, their opposition grew. People were getting too much fluoride, it didn't actually work to improve dental health, and it seemed to be increasingly dangerous. They noted the many forms of damage to the nervous system. In animal studies, unborn babies exposed to fluoride were hyperactive their entire lives. Young or adult animals showed depressed activity. The mechanism seemed to be that key brain chemicals that form the crucial cell membranes of brain cells were depleted. Damage to brain and kidney was found at the supposed optimal level of one part per million, even though rats are much more resistant to fluoride than humans. Other research showed that fluoride accumulates in the pineal gland, where it interferes with production of melatonin, disrupting sleep cycles. That inhibition also tends to induce early sexual maturation, both in animals and in humans. The scientists were also extremely concerned about evidence of bone pathology. The National Toxicology Program found bone cancers related to fluoridated water in a two-year animal study. Numerous studies have found higher incidence of bone fractures in the elderly in fluoridated than in non-fluoridated communities. The union scientists then got active and approached fluoride as the EPA would any other toxic chemical. They calculated what's called the reference dose. This is the safe daily dosage of fluoride based on the new research on neurotoxicity. They found that a person working in Washington, D.C., drinking a quart of water a day at work would receive over 100 times that safe daily dosage. So they filed a grievance with EPA, demanding non-fluoridated water be made available to their employees at work. And Dr. Hersey pointed out the implications for the rest of us. According to the latest research, EPA's standard method for determining toxic risk requires us to stop using our drinking water reservoirs as disposal sites for toxic waste. Remember, the vast majority of fluoride put into U.S. waters for fluoridation purposes is in fact fluorosilicic acid, an unrefined waste product of phosphate fertilizer manufacture. It is contaminated with EPA impermissible levels of lead, arsenic, and other carcinogens. This is not pharmaceutical-grade dental fluoride, but it is exactly what Portland City Council is planning to put into our drinking water and to make us pay for it. The New York Review felt that not enough was known about the health effects of fluoridation, but that the implications were so serious that they pleaded for more and better safety studies. Evidence indicates many forms of brain damage, and they wanted a number of tests of fluoride's effect on intellectual ability, including dementia. They wanted to know much more about bone fracture risk and damaging levels of skeletal fluorosis, and whether those risks were higher in people with kidney problems, the elderly, and postmenopausal women. They wanted more information about the effects of fluoride on endocrine function, including thyroid disease, rickets, the pineal gland, and diabetes. They wanted proof that it was safe for the digestive tract and didn't damage fertility. They demanded proof that fluoride didn't damage kidney and liver function, have unusually severe effects on people with com compromised immune systems, or cause bladder cancer. So, the York Review felt strongly that they needed much more high-quality evidence before they could begin to judge that fluoride is safe. The EPA asked the National Academy of Sciences National Research Council to review their safe drinking water standard, and in 2006, they released a three-year study on fluoride toxicity. They found the standard was too high that it causes significant dental damage and elevates consumers' risk of bone damage. The study recommended that the standard be lowered. Even so, the EPA announced in 2011 that they would not lower the standard. The chairman of that review panel, Dr. John Duell, one of our most eminent toxicologists, said, When we looked at the studies that have been done, we found that many of these questions are unsettled, and we have much less information than we should. Since then, a series of recent reports, including the National Toxicology Program study and another one from Harvard, show an increasingly strong connection between fluoride and osteosarcoma, a rare bone cancer in children. A new NIH study carried out by Harvard University last year gives even stronger evidence that children who drink fluoridated water have significantly lower IQs than those in non-fluoridated areas. 
A big part of the problem is that, unlike normally administered drugs, there's no way to control the dosage of fluoride in fluoridated water. Not only does the concentration vary, but some people drink much more water than average. Since water fluoridation began, people have vastly increased their fluoride intake from other sources, including beverages, processed food, tea, pesticide residue, and fluoridated dental products. Exposure can be much higher than the average estimates. So, not only does the best science we have show fluoride to be unsafe for the environment, particularly in the Northwest, and that ingesting fluoride does no good and significant harm to teeth, but we also find that, while much more study needs to be done, a growing body of evidence indicates that ingesting fluoride can have major detrimental health effects. But what about the children? The main argument in favor of fluoridating Portland's water seems to be that poor children don't have access to dental health care, and putting fluoride in the drinking water will rectify this social injustice. The York Review looked specifically at this issue and found that the evidence in its favor was of poor quality, contradictory, and unreliable. In fact, black and Latino children are significantly more likely to suffer from fluorosis than white children. It's also true that low-income families are more likely to suffer from malnutrition and thus are more vulnerable to the toxic effects of fluoride. At the same time, they're less likely to be able to afford bottled water or filtration systems to defend themselves once fluoridation begins. The most serious oral health problem facing poor children is early childhood caries, also known as baby bottle tooth decay. Research has repeatedly found this problem is just as common in fluoridated communities as in non-fluoridated ones, so fluoridation actually does nothing to help. The people who get the highest dose of fluoride are bottle-fed babies, because all their nutrition comes from liquids and because they're so little. Breast milk is virtually fluoride-free. Mothers' bodies try to protect babies against taking in any fluoride at all. The major risk factor for fluorosis is being exposed to fluoride as infants when teeth are being formed. So many researchers, even the American Dental Association, who are fluoridation's biggest booster, advise parents not to use fluoridated water in making baby formula. Civil rights leader Andrew Young, colleague of Martin Luther King, former mayor of Atlanta and former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, after supporting fluoridation for many years, fought it in Georgia in 2011. He was concerned about poor babies being forced to drink fluoridated water. This is an issue of fairness, civil rights, and compassion. We must find better ways to prevent cavities, helping those most at risk to obtain access to the services of a dentist. In fact, the Surgeon General estimates that 80% of dentists will not treat children on Medicaid. If we have $5 million to spend on the dental health of poor children, instead of giving it to industry to put unrefined industrial waste in our drinking water so as to give unregulated doses of a drug whose effectiveness is doubtful and whose safety is questionable to not only every person but every organism in our watershed, doesn't it make more sense to use that $5 million to establish a citywide dental hygiene program for the poor, giving every child who needs it access to effective dental care, the only thing that's been proven to improve childhood dental health? Let me add that it's true that the similar chemical, chlorine, is already added to our water, as required by federal law, to protect from bacterial contamination. Chlorine is part of normal biochemistry and doesn't bioaccumulate like fluorine. Anyone who doesn't want to drink chlorine can filter it out fairly easily and cheaply with a simple inline filter or something like a Brita pitcher. That's what we do at my house. But chlorine is a larger molecule than fluorine. Filtering fluoride out of water is quite complicated. An expensive reverse osmotic filter system will get rid of between 65 and 95 percent of fluoride. To get rid of all of it, you'll have to invest in an even more expensive distillation system. Not only has the vast majority of the developed world rejected fluoridation, hundreds of communities in countries that do fluoridate have refused to allow it, and these cities and towns, among a great many smaller ones around the world, used to fluoridate but have stopped because of the health dangers, doubtful effectiveness, and unnecessary expense. As Andrew Young pointed out, Many things that we began to do 50 or more years ago, we now no longer do because we have learned further information that changes our practices and policies. So it is with fluoridation. So, if fluoridation is such a bad idea, why do so many support it? Well, industry's interest is obvious. They'd rather be paid to dump it in drinking water than have to pay to dispose of it safely in landfills. And they'd rather be lauded as heroes then sued for being heartless polluters. It's important enough to them that they're willing to put a lot of money into getting politicians and voters on their side. 
Health officials, dentists, the CDC, all are in a difficult position. How do you tell people that the thing you've told them is good for them is actually really bad for them? It's hard to turn around that big a ship, and the many-decade commitment that has been made to fluoridation forces many guardians of public health into a state of denial. It may take a change of generation to get a new attitude from the public health community. A great many citizens support fluoridation out of genuine concern for the health and welfare of the population, especially the disadvantaged. Some claim personal experience that has convinced them, but anecdotal evidence is not science, and they are working with outdated information. Our predecessors, Portland's founding fathers, with astonishing foresight, gave us an incredible gift. Our primary water source is the Bull Run Watershed, one of the finest, purest municipal water systems in the country, and undoubtedly one of the best in the world. Adding fluorosilicic acid, an unpurified waste byproduct of phosphate fertilizer production, to this magnificent drinking water source is a slap to the city's founders' faces and seems incredibly short-sighted. Please join me in voting to keep Portland's water clean, to protect our children, our environment, and the poor from misguided interference with a phenomenal resource. Vote no on fluoridation. And don't forget to get your ballots in by May 21st. Thank you very much.